Okay, folks, uh, I'm going to do some groundwork with Chinaco, and incidentally, I wanted to tell my cousin in core school, this is Chinaco. I know you can't believe it. He's grown up quite a bit, but this is my colt. So that's what you're watching, a tall gray colt now instead of a short little black one. And I also want to mention uh, Lane Painter. He's a young man in Oklahoma that's going to be a cow puncher. And uh, I want you to know, Lane, that the reason... The main reason that I do these videos is to pass something on. And if you can get something out of it, good on you. And what it'll do is save you time with horses down the road. And you'll give it an opportunity that a lot of us didn't have where we had to learn it the hard way. The hard way means that the horse didn't come out real good. So, Lane, I'm trying to share some things with you that you can save a whole lot of good horses and make them better than I ever thought of. So... Good luck, partner, and thanks for sending me the message. So what this is about today is, is about the feel. And the exercise is going to be for this colt to come over and pick me up off a mounting block. And uh, it's not a parlor trick because I keep the halter on and I'm direction and impulsion with my body. So we don't want to get confused with liberty training, which is when you turn them loose and make them do tricks. This is not a trick. This is an exercise where I can get this colt to be feeling good about me being above it and move off of my feel. The more I have to move my impulsion hand, the more he tells me he hasn't got it. So the idea is to be able to do it with just a direct, direction. So if you, if you look at it like I do, you're, in fact, you're actually riding. I'm riding the colt. Now my right hand is going to be direction, my left hand is impulsion. The lead rope isn't supposed to come tight. I'd like him to cross over behind. I don't want him to push on me. I'll step him over behind. And I'll send him again. Hind quarter. Disengage. Now, I'm going to ask him with as little as I can do to go by me. If he can't make it, I'll come in with my spur and say you need to move. If you watch the horse, you'll see the brain engage and disengage. What I want to tell you about, to carry on the story about the lady that got a hold of me and asked me, I quote, my opinion of the Mustang program. I've already shared with you about the remount, which was a big part of the, the way all this happened. And uh, I want to thank the folks that wrote me notes about the remount because there's a lot of people out there whose grandfathers were involved and some folks still standing upright were involved. So it's, it's real interesting to me because I like history. So the second thing that I want to tell you about is that the 1970 is when they passed the law for the Free Roaming Wild Horse and Burrow Act. And uh, the, the woman asked me about my opinion of the Mustang program. And what it means is that when you see the word Mustang in the program, they always show horses loping out across the pasture or the hills. And, and a whole lot of people, the Mustang is the symbol of the West. It stands for freedom, it means who we are, what we are, and it's all America, okay? Personally, that's not what I think is what represents the West. So I'll tell you about a roundup they had in the 1860s, 
And uh, incidentally, this is just one story. There was a whole lot of these that went on all over the country. But the government went up to northern Arizona and made a roundup. And they gathered over 2,000 head. And they took them down to New Mexico. Bosque Redondo is the name of the country. And they spent five years down there and about half of them died. And uh, then they found out that the program wasn't working. So they let them go back to their home country. But what they did do when they took them back to their home country is they set limits on them. In other words, they put boundaries, basically built a fence around them. And so what they decided to do was to what they used the word simulate or educate, turn them into I don't know what the term they used. They want them to be civilized. They were no longer allowed to be free roaming and wild. And what I'm talking about in this particular chapter is the Navajo people. It wasn't Mustangs. It wasn't wild horses. It was people. Real people with a heartbeat. And they were gathered up, sent to a holding corral, placed there, and then let to go back with fences around them. So to me, the Native American is the symbol of the West. And it, it's the romance side. It's the beautiful side. It's everything that I believe the West is, is what I, when I picture it, I see the Native American. Okay? Now, I'd like you to think about the word Native American. Native means that they are indigenous people. The horse was introduced by the Spaniards. So that's just another part of the chapter of my opinion on the horse program. Okay, one little side note is that in 1929, the Depression hit. And when the Depression hit, a whole lot of people, ranchers, just turned their livestock loose. Cattle weren't worth anything, sheep weren't worth anything, a lot of guys just walked away from it because they were starving to death. So a lot of horses joined the wild horses the depression time. So in other words, you could catch a wild horse and he happened to have a brand on him and shoes. So that was part of it. Now, up to date, now we have this program that the law was enacted to protect them. And the BLM basically got the short straw. And they were set up to fail the day after the law passed because of the restrictions put on them and how to manage the herd. Well, the word manage means the same difference as when you have a sheep or a cow permit. You're only allowed so many animals on a certain area. And, for example, the ranch we were on, they, the turnout was November 1st, and they had to be off the range June 1st. Now it was up to the rancher to get that done. And you paid per month per head for that, that right of of having that grass. And incidentally, that grass that the cattle and sheep are on is, is known as multiple use. In other words, it's for everybody. Hunting, fishing, biking, hiking, trail riding. It's for the people. Well, the ranchers use it for grazing so they can feed the people. All right, so now you've got the wild horse deal going. And as of today, I'll give you the short numbers. It's a budget of like $50 million they got. That's how much they have to spend. That's their budget every year. So there's 80000 out on the range as near as they can figure. And there's 50000 in captivity. So just for example, you go out and you make a circle and you gather a bunch of wild horses. And of course there's a stud with a bunch of mares. That's what a band looks like. All the young studs are off by themselves. So you bring these mares in and a percentage of them are going to be pregnant. So now they're standing in a holding facility, no longer free roaming. And they foal in the corral. When that colt stands up, until it does something different, it has hay and water right in front of it. So it's no longer a wild horse. It's been domesticated. It's been put in a corral. 
So since the 70s, if you do the math and the logic, a whole lot of horses have been adopted that never were out on the range. Because most people don't adopt 25-year-old mares. They'll, they'll get the colts. All right, so now what do we do about it? Because I told you originally that the, the Mustang program is an emotional thing. And it's very, very emotional for a whole lot of people. Okay, so there's no argument. I'm not going to get in an argument with anybody. All I'm doing is sharing my opinion because I was asked. So here's my opinion. You got a whole bunch of horses. You got a whole bunch of state parks. All right. The Forest Service has a whole lot of money because we, the people, every time you go through the gate into a state park, you pay a fee. The people in the East Coast, in the Midwest, they pay taxes. They pay into this whole deal. We live out west. There's a whole lot of people that never see a Mustang and or a wild horse. And they're paying taxes. So what my, th what my plan is, is to tell the government to gather up and do the math. And say you take a park like Yellowstone. And you take how many ever bands that park will hold. Let them range cons figure it out. And then you hand them to the Forest Service and said, here, now you manage them. Because the BLM will admittedly tell you they haven't done well. And they were set up to fail, I'm telling you. So now everybody in the United States that comes out west and goes to Yosemite, and Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon, they all have the opportunity to see what their tax dollar is paying for. All right, now you have this big surplus of horses. Thousands. Every park you can put... How many ever horses you can in? Now you got all these extra horses. So here's the part. Here's the hook. Here's what I say. The Native Americans, we encroached on them. Okay? It wasn't us personally because it was our forefathers. Well, okay. Moving right along. There's thousands of Navajo, just as an example, that don't have running water and adequate housing. This is in the United States of America in the year 2019. Now you've got this big surplus of horses. The BIA says they don't have the money to help these people out. So where do you think a guy could get the money to help these Native Americans get good housing and running water? There you go. That's my opinion. Thank what you. I'm trying to do is make this horse feel comfortable about coming over and picking me up because, as you can guess, he's a year and a half old and he's already 15 hands. So he's going to be 17 hands at least by the time I throw my leg over him. And I knew that. His sire's 17 hands. But what I want him to understand is that no matter where I'm at, if I'm out in the brush and can get up on a rock or a log, I want him to come pick me up. And this is all about a feel. It's all about a feel. How well can I do this and get this horse to know that the best place in California is to be standing right over here in front of this? I let him know that's the place to be. He missed the mark. I'll get him to step over behind. Boom. Now I'm going to ask him to come on in. Now, I know there's things on the ground, but I don't care. That's just, that's nothing. He can get past all of that. I'm asking. I'm asking. It's up to him to figure this out. I'm kneeing him with my right leg. Figure it out, partner. Now I'm going to tell him this is the best place to be right here. Now in the reality of this exercise is I'm in the right eye and the left eye. When you're actually doing groundwork, it's hard to do until you switch directions. But here they can be standing still and you can do it a different way, which is where I'm going to end up. So now he gets a separation of yes, I want you to stay and yes, I want you to leave.
Now what all this stuff amounts to is that when you're done, it's no different trailer loading. They want to come pick you up because they know that's the one place in the corral where there's no pressure. You notice how tight I'm holding the lead rope. So this is this is what this exercise is all about. Now the goal is is how little can I do to get this horse to come over and stand here where I want him? What's it gonna take? How many times do I have to do this? Well I have to do it as many times as it takes, that's how many. And he knows where to put his feet. He just put his left front foot intentionally so he didn't hit his leg on the mounting block. I'm not on top of a fence where he's got a smooth entrance. He's got to walk around that mounting block. Then he took an intentional step forward. So the jig is up. In other words, he knows what to do. And all I want him to do is to feel comfortable about it and not have not be bothered about it. It's like everything I want. This is me. Later on, I'll be moving him around on the end of the rope from the ground when I'm doctoring something. And I want him to feel good about the feel. Now watch his feet and see where he places himself. Where does he need to be? Now he blew out that time, so we'll move him back over. Now this is how a horse thinks. My job is to see how well I can present this and see if I can get him to step intentionally. If he doesn't, it doesn't mean I failed. and It doesn't mean he's mad or stubborn or anything. It just means he hasn't made it yet. So he's going to figure out that there's one place that works out really well. Every time he makes the correct move, I got to release. Now I'm going to try to get him to come over closer because I can feel that hindquarter starting to leave. We'll work on that. There goes the right hind. Pressure. You don't pay off the wrong thing. Pay off the right thing. Now I'm going to keep his head right here this time and ask that hindquarter to move over. There. Now see how he's getting upset? Well, I'm fine. There. This is what I call loading up. I get to watch his skeleton and he'll load up his body. He'll load up all his muscles. There, that's intentional. That was intentional, so I'm going to really pay that off. That's exactly what I needed. So, like everything else I do, once he's learned it, and once I've done what it is I'm supposed to be doing as making a ranch horse out of him, I want him to be able to do something without duress, without resentment. He just simply does it. This is no different than chasing a cow and rating so I can rope it. It's the same thing. And he's like, okay, so, so that's where we're at. Thank you.